Hello and welcome to NTD News. I'm Evelyn Leap. Here are today's top stories. Today, President Biden met with local and federal leaders to discuss how they'll advance his gun violence prevention plan. The strategy includes stemming illegal gun sales, supporting law enforcement, and investing in intervention programs. Protests erupted in Cuba against their communist regime over the weekend as a country undergoes a grave economic crisis aggravated by the pandemic. President Biden says the U.S. stands firmly with the people of Cuba and many American lawmakers also expressed their support. The Agriculture Department's race-based loan relief program is halted. The, pro the program began under Biden and excludes white farmers. The J&J vaccine may get a new warning related to a neurological condition. Reports say the FDA is preparing to make the announcement. YouTube deletes a video from CPAC 2021 and issues a strike against the event organizer. The video includes a keynote speech by former President Trump saying he'll sue big tech companies for violating his First Amendment rights. President Biden today met with leaders in his administration as well as local officials and law enforcement teams to advance his plan to reduce gun violence. Biden's plan includes a strategy to stem the flow of guns, support law enforcement, and invest in community intervention programs. Here's Entity's Melina Weiskopf with more details from Washington, D.C. President Biden's strategy to prevent gun violence includes a couple of approaches. He wants to work with local communities to crack down on gun dealers making illegal gun sales. Biden also gave the green light for crime-ridden communities to use money from the COVID relief funds to minimize gun violence. Our strategy provides uh, including funding for law enforcement through the American Rescue Plan for states, cities, and to be able to hire police and pay them overtime in order to advance community policing. $350 billion from the $1.9 trillion COVID relief package is redirected for communities to invest in violence intervention programs and expand employment services, including summer jobs for young people and training programs for those coming out of prison or jail. Programs to help get job training, apprenticeships and work experience so they can uh, gain stability and security and a chance for a better life. According to the Gun Violence Archive, this year there has been 346 mass shootings and 16 mass murders. More than 23,000 people have died from gun violence incidents. 12,738 died by suicide and 10,719 died by homicide. Some Republicans claim this increase in gun violence could have been partly induced by the Democrats' defund the police movement. Democratic Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams has spoken out against the defund the police movement and he joined Biden at the White House Monday to discuss how to implement Biden's strategy back in New York City. Adams just won the New York City mayoral primaries. We have to use and better utilize our police officers. Too many clerical assignments police officers are doing. Many of them are doing roles that they should not be doing. So once we do the right assessment, then we can make that determination that do we need to hire more to keep the city of New York safe. And Biden wants to take even greater measures to prevent gun violence by passing some gun control laws, but he can't do that alone. He'll have to get Congress involved there. Biden's called on Congress to pass laws to require extensive background checks for gun sales. Biden also wants to eliminate qualified immunity. But gun rights activists say that this could put gun manufacturers out of business. So this measure would be tough, if possible at all, to get through Congress. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. And thousands of Cubans took to the streets over the weekend, speaking out against the communist regime. This is the country struggles with food shortages and an economic crisis. President Biden and U.S. lawmakers expressed their support for the Cuban people on Monday. President Biden addressed the situation okay. in Cuba Monday afternoon. The Cuban people demanding their freedom from an authoritarian regime. And I don't think we've seen anything like this protest. Uh, in a long, long time, if quite frankly ever. Um, the United States stands firmly with the people of Cuba as they assert their universal rights. And we call on the government, the government of Cuba, to refrain from violence or attempts to silence the voice of the people of Cuba. Biden said that Cuba protests are remarkable. In an earlier statement on Monday, he also called on the Cuban regime to hear their people and serve their needs. 
The White House has been closely monitoring the protests in the country. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan warned against targeting of peaceful protesters who are exercising their universal rights. Protests in Cuba erupted on Sunday, with thousands taking to the streets across the country. It comes amid food and medicine shortages, rising prices, along with the CCP virus crisis. But Cuba's leader blamed the United States for the unrest. In capital city Havana, protesters chanted freedom, enough and join as the police arrived. The police launched tear gas and violently arrested people. The internet service was cut off by the authorities throughout Sunday afternoon. Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee Bob Menendez said in a statement on Sunday, the world's eyes are on Cuba tonight and the dictatorship must understand we will not tolerate the use of brute force to silence the aspirations of the Cuban people. Senator Marco Rubio, who is of Cuban descent, says Cubans are rising up because they want freedom. They're tired of living under tyranny and they're tired of they're living under incompetent leaders. That's what the Cuban regime is. Because socialism and Marxism doesn't work. It's a failure. It's a failure everywhere it's been tried and it's having a catastrophic impact on the people of Cuba. And Senator Ted Cruz, the son of a Cuban immigrant, also tweeted his support. He says the communist Cuban regime will be consigned to the dustbin of history and the American people stand squarely with the men and women of Cuba and their noble fight for liberty. Some analysts say Sunday's demonstrations were the biggest in Cuba since 1994. Many Cuban citizens are losing their internet connections amid large-scale protests against the country's communist regime. Local authorities are reportedly shutting down internet service. Authoritarian regimes tend to cut off internet to stop anti-government protests from gaining more traction. Similar shutdowns struck earlier this year when pro-democracy protests broke out in Burma or Myanmar. Now, some suspect that China is behind Cuba's internet censorship. Florida Senator Marco Rubio wrote on Twitter that Cubans use a system that was made, sold and installed by China to control and block access to the internet. What's more, the only company in Cuba that provides internet access has three primary tech providers and all of them are Chinese. China leads the world, internet, world in internet restriction tactics. It's developed a sophisticated system called the Great Firewall that blocks its citizens from visiting websites critical of the Chinese regime. According to a U.S. delegation, the future of Haiti's leadership remains unclear following the assassination of their president. Meanwhile, the U.S. is still considering Haiti's request for troops to be sent. Following the assassination of the Haitian president, a U.S. delegation traveled to Haiti on Sunday. President Biden was briefed on their findings Monday morning. He addressed the matter at a gun violence meeting. Over the weekend, I dispatched a, uh, a high-level expert delegation to assess the situation and to determine where the United States can offer our support. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki gave remarks on the delegation's findings in a press briefing earlier on Monday. What was clear from their trip is that there is a lack of clarity about the future of political leadership. That's an important step that the people of Haiti, uh, the different governing leaders of Haiti, need to work together to determine a united path forward. Haiti has sent a formal request for the U.S. to send troops. According to Psaki, the request is still under review and the possibility has not been ruled out. The FDA is expected to slap another side effect warning on the J&J &J vaccine. This one's Guillain-Barre syndrome. The Washington Post reports that the FDA is preparing to announce this change, but no date was given. Guillain-Barre syndrome is a rare disorder and causes a person's metabolism to attack the body's own nerves. This can cause a person's muscle to weak, muscles to weaken and sometimes paralysis. The CDC's database shows at least 75 cases of the syndrome reported after vaccination. Other vaccines like Moderna and Pfizer vaccines have, been, have each been linked to at least twice that number of Guillain-Barre reports after vaccination. But they haven't gotten that warning label. We're still waiting to hear back from the FDA. The latest U.S. report on atrocities around the world is out. China and Burma are at the top of the, of the State Department's high-risk list. list. Entities Miguel Moreno has more on that. Congress made preventing atrocities like genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes a priority a few years ago. Secretary of State Antony Blinken underlined a difference in this year's prevention report. This year, for the first time, the report provides direct, 
detailed accounts of atrocities taking place in specific countries, including Burma, Ethiopia, China, and Syria. Burma or Myanmar and China were at the top of the high-risk list. The report says the U.S. is working with allies to stop the military regime from killing protesters and to have it give back power to the democratically elected government. Blinken also doubled down on their labeling the Chinese Communist Party's persecution of Uyghur Muslims a genocide and a crime against humanity. But this report is about atrocity prevention. Reporters question how change could come about in Xinjiang if the regime refused us to cooperate. We totally uh, regret the refusal of the Chinese government, number one, to let people in to look at what's happening in that situation. We're maintaining, as you mentioned, pressure with our international partners on China, both to let people in and to change its behavior. And it cannot be just by the United States alone. It has to be with our partners around the world. The U.S. has punished Chinese companies, officials, and banned products linked to the human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. The Agriculture Department won't be able to grant loan relief based solely on the farmers' rates for now. One of their programs excludes white farmers and a judge is halting it. NTD's Ellison Lee has the details. U.S. District Judge S. Thomas Anderson granted a preliminary injunction last week against a federal loan forgiveness program that excludes white farmers, essentially halting it. The Agriculture Department under President Biden created the program known as Section 1005. The judge wrote, absent action by the court, socially disadvantaged farmers will obtain debt relief, while plaintiff will suffer the irreparable harm of being excluded from that program solely on the basis of his race. Section 1005 was part of the American Rescue Plan that Biden sponsored. The program says it provides relief to socially disadvantaged farmers. The Agriculture Department defines them as Black, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Hispanic, Asian, or Pacific Islander. The department claims it was to address the cumulative effects of discrimination. White Tennessee farmer Robert Holman sued over the program. He argues that it is unconstitutional and violates the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause. And the judge favors his argument. He ruled that, however important the goal of eliminating the vestiges of prior race discrimination, and it is important, the government's efforts cannot withstand strict scrutiny. Therefore, plaintiff has shown a likeliness of success on the merits at trial. The Agriculture Department won't be able to grant any loan relief under the program for now, but the lawsuit is still ongoing. Allison Lee, NTD News. And YouTube blocked a video from the Dallas Conservative Political Action Conference from, be, from being shared on that platform. That video includes former President Trump's announcement that he would file lawsuits against big tech companies. The organizers of the event say it's another example of big tech censorship. YouTube issued a strike against the American Conservative Union, or ACU, and took down their video from CPAC 2021. The event featured a keynote address by former President Trump, along with speeches by other prominent conservatives. The ACU says it was sanctioned by YouTube for posting a video featuring Trump, announcing a lawsuit against prominent big tech companies. The organization was also banned from posting for one week. ACU Chairman Matt Schlapp released a statement saying, It is clear that YouTube censored CPAC because we stood with former President Donald Trump on his lawsuit against big tech. The ACU says Google prizes political bias over free speech. Trump and other speakers at CPAC also blasted Google and other big tech companies for censorship. The radical left and big tech's attack on free speech is unlawful, it's unconstitutional, and it is completely un-American. In his speech, Trump says he's suing big tech to protect free speech. And we will keep on fighting until we have stopped this assault on our liberties and until we have restored the sacred right to freedom of speech for every single American. YouTube claimed the offending video included medical misinformation about COVID-19, according to a statement released by the ACU. But YouTube didn't provide any examples of what violated their policies. Another monument is coming down in the city of Charlottesville, Virginia, after a weekend vote. The decision comes alongside other statue removals, featuring Southern Generals Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Here are the details. Public parks in Charlottesville, Virginia are getting a change. Statues of two Southern Generals, Robert Lee and Thomas Stonewall Jackson, were removed from pedestals there. The generals led the Confederate Army during the Civil War. 
That's just days after the city unanimously voted to remove a monument dedicated to 19th century explorers Meriwether Lewis, William Clark, and Sacagawea on Saturday. A move to remove the statues began in 2016. That prompted the Unite the Right Way rally in Charlottesville in summer 2017. Protesters defending the Lee statue clashed with counter-protesters, including anarchic communist group Antifa. In November 2019, the city council voted to remove the Lewis Clark Sacagawea statue. It was criticized for portraying Sacagawea, a Native American interpreter, as what some called cowering beneath her travel companions, while some defenders see her position on the statue not as a subservient crouch, but as an active woman tracking or gathering herbs. The city council set aside about $1 million to cover the removal of all three statues. In a Friday statement, Charlottesville officials explained that the statues would be kept in storage until they make a final decision about what to do with them. The National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. is lifting its pandemic restrictions today. People from all over the world can once again make a spontaneous trip to view the masterpieces. Entity's Anna Skibinski speaks with the visitors about their experience. A sign that the nation's capital is bouncing back to normal, the National Gallery of Art is reopening once again at full capacity this week. Guests can come and go at leisure. I am excited for more leniency in when I can arrive, how long I can stay. Museum volunteers tell us what they think the museum has to offer after a year-long lockdown. It offers a respite, so it's a way to sort of get away from uh, the pandemic. And it's so calming when you walk inside. And of course, it's filled with all of my friends, all of the works of art, and of course, my friends who volunteer here and work here. And pondering the artwork together is a great way for friends to connect. We were like really fascinated by the, um, the fruit. The still the, life. The, yeah, <laughs> still life. I was having a friend come in from uh, Chicago last week and I was trying to get a pass, you know, for the two of us. And we did, but I mean, it's more restrictive. But now that the museum is lifting its restrictions, he won't need a pass when he brings his friend next time. And one regular visitor says she's already seeing more people. Um, I think the museum has more people in it today than the last time I was here because, you know, there aren't as many places that are open. So that's really, I mean, it's kind of wonderful in a way that so many people are seeing this wonderful art, you know. And some visitors are appreciating pieces they did not notice much before. For example, our Impressionist collection is one of the most popular. But now as I walk around and see visitors, I see them enjoying a whole range of art, perhaps art that they hadn't even thought about before, that they go in and learn, learn something new. Just like everything, I feel very grateful and uh, you know, happy to be here and happy to be able to experience such amazing things. And, and that's true of all of our lives, right? Something else to enjoy here at the National Gallery are the outdoor concerts, and those will be starting up again soon. Anna Skibinski, NTD News. British billionaire Richard Branson soared more than 50 miles above New Mexico on Sunday aboard his Virgin Galactic rocket plane. His safe return marked the vehicle's first fully crewed test flight to space. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. Branson was one of six Virgin Galactic employees strapped in for the ride. The eccentric billionaire has touted the mission as a precursor to a new era of space tourism. Virgin is poised to begin commercial operations next year. The flight's success also gave the entrepreneur bragging rights. The endeavor launched a highly publicized rivalry with fellow billionaire Jeff Bezos. The 57-year-old billionaire had hoped to fly into space first, aboard his own space company's rocket. I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth because I feel I'm still in space. So, uh, and some of you will say I'm normally in space, so, um, but um, I will, I'll do my best. The gleaming white space plane was carried aloft on Sunday, attached to the underside of a dual fuselage jet named Eve, after Branson's late mother. The aircraft took off from Spaceport America, a state-owned facility near Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Virgin Galactic leases a large section of the 18,000-acre site. Reaching its high-altitude launch point at about 46,000 feet, the VSS Unity passenger rocket plane was released from the mothership. The crew then ignited its rocket, blasting it upward at supersonic speed into the darkness of space, some 53 miles high. I was once a kid with a dream uh, looking up to the stars, 
And now I'm an adult in a spaceship looking back to our beautiful Earth. To the next generation of dreamers, if we can do this, just imagine what you can do. Virgin has said it plans at least two further test flights. That's before starting regular commercial operation in 2022. Several hundred people have already booked reservations, priced at around $250,000 per ticket. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Up next, New York City still has a few months to go to the next mayoral election. But one candidate says it's unfair that some act like the race has already been decided. The Denver FBI and the city's police department are coordinating an investigation into weaponry seized at a hotel. The hotel was only two blocks away from the stadium hosting the Major League Baseball All-Star Game this Tuesday. New York City is going to vote for a new mayor in a few months. Some seem to be sure that the Democratic nominee is going to win the race, but the Republican nominee reminds people the outcome hasn't been decided yet. And today's Arian Pastar has a story. Three died and seven have been left injured after multiple shootings in New York City on Sunday. Now on Monday, Democratic candidate for the mayoral race, Eric Adams, has met with President Biden to address the gun problem in New York City. But his opponent, Curtis Slewa, wasn't invited to that meeting. And he says that isn't right. Blasio is not in Washington, D.C., who is our mayor. At least I don't believe he is. Governor Cuomo, our governor, is not in Washington, D.C. I don't believe he is. Sliwa says he should have been invited to D.C. too because of his personal experience with shootings. Because I'm the only mayoral candidate who was shot five times with hollow point bullets by members of the Gambino crime family. Secondarily, I went through the federal court system for separate trials in which there was great discussion about the actual weapon that was used, the 38 Special. He blamed media outlets for ignoring the fact that the mayoral elections didn't even take place yet. If you read the headlines, he's already the mayor. This is a democratic process. There's still an election that will determine the next mayor of the city of New York. He added that Adams, who is a former NYPD captain, does have the experience to talk about gun violence. But Sliwa also wanted to be part of that conversation. Sliwa says he would bring gun violence down by refunding the police and reversing bail reform, which took effect in New York City last year. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. An investigation is underway after Denver police seized multiple firearms, body armors and over 1,000 rounds of ammunition at a hotel Friday. The hotel was just two blocks away from where the Major League Baseball All-Star Game is playing this week in Colorado. Three men and one woman were arrested at the Maven Hotel, two blocks away from Coors Field Stadium. Denver police said Sunday that they were acting on a tip from a hotel employee. The city's police chief said they are still investigating why the, in why the individuals had the weapons close to the downtown area. On Sunday, the Denver FBI said they have no reason to believe the incident was connected to terrorism or a threat directed to the All-Star Game. Three of the suspects have been charged with possession of a weapon by a previous offender. As MLB events get underway Tuesday, Denver officials are reassuring the public there is no ongoing threat in the area. And it's raining fish in Utah. In a government effort to replenish lakes, tens of thousands of juvenile fish took a nosedive from a plane. 35,000 tiny fish are raining down on Utah lakes. The local Division of Wildfire Resources released a video on Friday showing this impressive sight. But the nosediving trouts were not part of a freakish weather phenomenon. They were released from an airplane chute along with water as part of the government division's efforts to replenish lakes. Because of their small size, the three-inch long fish called fingerlings are able to survive the fall with little harm or stress. Fish stocking by air has been practiced in Utah since the 1950s, but it isn't the only method. According to a blog post by the division's biologist, Matt McKell, this task is most often carried out with a truck. In remote areas, though, fish are also transported on foot, horseback, and even on dirt bikes. 
Tesla cars are so popular, it seems even rats want a piece of them. According to Fox, one owner in Manhattan says a rat chewed through the car's cabling and took a nap in the car's glove compartment. Tesla uses soy to insulate its cables instead of oil because it's cheaper and better for the environment. But even though rats apparently like the soy, Tesla says it's not to blame and won't cover the repair costs. NTD's Petra Caden has a story. Fox News reports that rats recently caused $5,000 worth of damage to a Tesla in Manhattan. Like other car makers, Tesla says it's not liable for damage caused by nature. A product from Hammer Technologies called RatMat deters rodents from cars. The company says Tesla cars are easy to access for the rodents. Tesla has some of these, unfortunately, has these, these entry points in their vehicles, so we've seen all of their all of their um, line attacked by rodents. So every single model has been. Proveneers says rats will attack any car, but EVs are being attacked more. Cars now have environmentally friendly electrical cables. The problem is rats enjoy eating them. And then on top of that, you've got the wiring that is, is now even more attractive to them because it, it's, it's soy based as well. So that, that, that they're attracted to that as well. Plus they have the warm battery. Cars are now food as well as shelter for the creatures. But if you think about it, an electric car is a very, very attractive um, site for a rodent because they can get into it and, and, and they're relatively undisturbed once they're inside. Humans can't get in, predators can't get in and access it. So it's a very attractive nesting site. He says that EVs in rural areas are getting attacked the most. And he's seeing this especially so in California, where his product is selling well. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. New York City Restaurant Week is coming back with a bang. Bookings open today for discounted lunch and dinner at many of the city's favorite spots. The deals will be on for five weeks starting July 19th. Lunch starts at $21 and dinner starts at $39 for an entree and a side. There are also signature dining experiences at select restaurants offering three-course meals and more, like special menus and a chance to meet the chef. But that's going to cost $125. Besides dining indoors and outdoors, customers can also order takeout and delivery. And smoke on top of smoke can be seen on the West Coast due to dozens of wildfires. Last year had record-setting wildfires, but what about this year? California's excessive heat warnings aren't stopping people from going out to pick their own sunflowers. They visit a, locker, they visit a local sunflower field to customize their bouquets. Wait is finally over. Shen Yun returns to the stage with an all new production filled with beauty, majesty, and a powerful message of hope. Discover the lost culture of ancient China. Discover this season, Shen Yun 2021. Coming to the Palace Theater, July 24th and 25th. Tickets at shenyun.com slash Stanford 888-90 shows. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well-rested in the morning. That's why I invented my pillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial right now. Retailers have canceled my pillow. And to thank you for your support, I'm going to pass the savings directly on to you. For example, you get my six piece towel sets, regular $109.99, now only $44.98. Or my pillow dog beds for as low as $19.99 with your promo code. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Navigating a world of economic madness, you need to have the right guide. What do today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why, what's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. Good evening. Thanks for joining us.
With high West Coast temperatures predicted for the coming weeks, residents and fire crews are on alert. Smoke can be seen from the dozens of active fires in this record-setting season. NTD's Andy Elsmore brings us more. We're here today near Loyalton, California, where the Beckworth Fire Complex behind me is sending smoke thousands of feet into the air. California has already had tens of thousands of acres burned, and CAL FIRE is saying this is already a record-setting fire season. The Beckworth Complex fire is a combination of two lightning fires close to the California-Nevada border. One of the blazes began on June 30th near Plumas National Forest. Fire crews rushed in to respond to the fire as it engulfed the small town of Doyle. It covers 90,000 acres of land. As of today, it's only 23% contained. But it's just one of dozens of fires burning in the parched western landscape. Due to the light snowpack and ongoing drought, the risk of fire is expected to be higher than previous years. From January to July 4th this year has more fires and acres burned compared to last year, according to CAL FIRE. In 2020, almost 10,000 fires burned a total of 4.2 million acres of California. Wildlife and vegetation could be at risk in California, but firefighters have been training and preparing. Andy Ellsmore, NT News. California. California public schools will now require students to wear masks when returning to campus this fall. The state's public health officials are saying this is the best way to prevent transmission of the CCP virus. And today's Brandon Dre has more on why some public schools believe the requirement should be optional. California health officials announced last week students will be required to wear masks in the classroom when the fall semester begins. This announcement comes at the same time the CDC stated vaccinated teachers and students don't need to wear face coverings inside school buildings. Despite the CDC guidance, California and Health Human Services Secretary Mark Galley made the decision. In California, uh, we believe that with masking and with testing as, a, uh, as an available option, that we can get kids back here in person. He also says the requirement will ensure that all kids are treated the same without any stigma attached to those who are vaccinated or unvaccinated. The mask requirement for students is drawing pushback from public school staff and faculty, as well as parents and children enrolled in the system. It's hard to see and smile at anyone and find out if they're smiling at you when you're wearing a mask and you're covered. Davis, who is on the Capistrano Unified School District Board of Trustees, says last month the board passed a 5-2 to two resolution encouraging the California Department of Health and CDC to allow wearing a mask optional for students and teachers. She says despite the board's differing opinions, data shows masking students does not reduce transmission in a classroom setting. Rather, it's impacting the students' mental, physical, and social health. Davis also says parents are feeling like they're losing control over their students' education and public schools are becoming more centralized by the state. There is, there is a belief in public education for a lot of reasons. And if we continue down that road where we are not offering an equal and fair education for all, we're going to be in a world of trouble. Dr. Galley and California public health officials say they will provide additional guidance and details about the student mask requirement in the coming days. Brandon Dre, NTD News, Los Angeles. Google is welcoming back employees on a voluntary basis to its California offices on Monday. That includes the company headquarters in Mountain View. Google reopens its offices and campuses in California to its workers on Monday after 16 months of closure. Employees working out of the California office have the option to return on a voluntary basis. According to state guidelines, workers who either haven't been fully vaccinated or declined to disclose their vaccination status are also welcome to return. But they will be required to wear masks on site and take COVID-19, also known as CCP virus, tests every week. Its usual employee services and amenities, including the free cafeteria meals, gym, and shuttle transportation are open too. The voluntary return on Monday is the first phase of a series of gradual reopening plans in the state before a full return in the fall. Then, the majority of Google employees are expected to work a hybrid schedule that includes about three days on-site and two days remote. Google has roughly 140,000 employees in close to 170 cities in 60 countries. About a quarter of its workforce is located in California. And it's sunflower season in California. Despite excessive heat warnings, people are still out picking their own bouquets. Here's NTD's Eileen Ang with more in the field, literally. 
Here at Dutch Hollow Farms, sunflowers are in season. Visitors can come visit the farm and pick their own and learn a few things about the flowers. We have single stem varieties and then we have branching types. John Boss, owner of Dutch Hollow Farms, says it's their third year growing sunflowers. There are over 35 different colors on the five acres. There's so many different varieties of sunflowers that people just didn't even realize because you're used to going to the store and you get your bunch of sunflowers and they're pretty much the same color every time, right? And this is what's great about the farm is there's so many different colors. Everybody can show their uniqueness and pick what they want. Despite the 100 degree weather, visitors still enjoy their time with family and friends. So what did you guys pick today? Um, I don't know, we got this yellow one and then I've never really seen a red one. And then this almost like white or it's pale yellow, yeah. You know, it's just beautiful to spend some time, you know, away from home, especially after this quarantine and everything, you know. He brought his family to the farm. His daughter loves the flowers. Is this your favorite one? Yeah. Why? Because it's so beautiful. Oh. Okay. Will you come back? Yeah. It's they're just so beautiful. You don't know which ones to pick from. And how did you decide what, what catches your eye? Just the different colors, you know, and the different heights and thinking how you can arrange them at home. Yeah. Boss recommends leaving the stem long and picking the sunflowers when they aren't in full bloom. If you just see them just partially open, that's the best time to pick them for longevity in the vase because they will open up at home. As long as they got partially open, you're good to go. He also suggests bringing a bucket with water to keep the sunflowers from wilting. His flowers are the pollenless varieties. After the season is over, he will replace them with corn for the corn maze in the fall. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. Coming up, China's capital city stands still as heavy rainfall hit Beijing on Sunday. Downpours caused floods, canceled flights and suspended classes. And the Taliban is calling China a friend. The terrorist group is seeking to hold talks with Beijing and welcoming Chinese investments in Afghanistan. That and more here on NTD News. Hundreds of flights canceled and over 10,000 people relocated. A major rainstorm is hitting Beijing and authorities are issuing a stay-at-home order. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more. The entire city of Beijing has come to a standstill. Hundreds of flights were canceled and schools were shut as the city faced the biggest storm of the year on Sunday. Around 15,000 people were evacuated from their homes. Downpours along with strong winds caused floods, halted public bus lines and forced tour sites to close. Beijing authorities have issued a stay-at-home order for everyone on Monday and they asked companies to let employees work from home. Heavy rains also caused trouble in other Chinese cities. Videos circulating online show flood water sweeping away people and cars in a city of 9 million. It's in Hebei province, which borders Beijing. The flood has submerged parts of the city, blocking roads and sewage pipes. More extreme weather conditions are expected in the coming days. On Monday, Chinese authorities issued a yellow warning for strong rainfall across the country. That's the third highest in their four-level warning system. Authorities in Beijing said accumulated rainfall since Sunday is expected to reach 2.3 to 4 inches on average. That's about one-sixth of the city's annual rainfall. And in southwestern China, Sichuan province, heavy rains drenched many areas over the weekend. More than a dozen rivers exceeded the flood warning level. Over 700,000 people have suffered from the flood, with a direct economic loss of over $330 million. That's according to Chinese state-run media. NTD cannot independently verify these figures. Online videos show the flood water overflowing a dam, forming a waterfall over 30 feet. About a dozen ships were engulfed by the running water and got swept downstream. Some witnesses said the ships were crushed into pieces instantly. After the river overflowed the banks, it soaked the first floors of some nearby buildings. Residents are spotted paddling on boats on the streets. Cars parked by the curbs are also floating like boats. On Sunday, 80% of a local town was submerged in water. Some buildings there had as many as two floors soaked in water. 8,000 people had to be evacuated. 
The Taliban says it sees China as its friend and hopes to talk with Beijing as soon as possible. While U.S. troops are pulling out of Afghanistan, the Taliban is inviting Beijing for reconstructions and investments and guarantees to ensure its safety. The Taliban says it sees China as a friend and promises Chinese investments in Afghanistan are secure. Media reports say the Taliban is now hoping for talks with Beijing. A Taliban spokesperson said they had been to China many times and have good relations with them, calling China a friendly country and welcoming it for reconstruction and developing Afghanistan. The United Nations has condemned the Taliban for supporting terrorism and providing weapons used to train terrorists. The Taliban's remarks come amid a withdrawal of U.S. troops. American forces have fought in Afghanistan for 20 years. President Biden pledged to withdraw all U.S. troops by September 11th of this year. I've concluded that it's time to end America's longest war. It's time for American troops to come home. But China seems to have something to say about the plan. China's foreign ministry posted a related notice late last month. It urged Chinese citizens to leave Afghanistan as soon as possible due to what is called severe and complex security concerns. China already evacuated more than 200 of its nationals from Afghanistan by charter flight this week. But as the situation in Afghanistan changes, so has Beijing's rhetoric. For years, China has blamed the U.S. for what it considers interfering in internal affairs. But early this month, China's foreign minister Wang Yi started accusing the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan of being irresponsible. He says Americans are walking away from the region. Days later, in a press conference, China's foreign ministry spokesman reiterated the blame, saying the withdrawal amounts to hypocrisy. And Lithuania is bolstering its ties with Taiwan and distancing itself from communist China. The Baltic nation has recently announced plans to open an office in Taiwan and to quit a forum led by China. Lithuania, an EU member state bordering Russia, seems to be growing more skeptical of Beijing and more sympathetic to Taiwan and Hong Kong. Earlier this month, Lithuania announced plans to open a trade representation office in Taiwan this year. The move angered Beijing, which claims the democratic island as its territory, despite having never ruled it. Few countries have official embassies in Taiwan. Instead, several EU countries host representative and trade offices on the island. The Chinese foreign ministry responded to the move, saying they firmly oppose all forms of official agencies in Taiwan. Meanwhile, Taiwan is thanking Lithuania for its support. There has been a surge in goodwill between the two sides. Lithuania has sent to Taiwan 20,000 doses of CCP virus vaccines, and Taiwan returned the favor with donations. Taiwan also gave Lithuania 100,000 surgical face masks last year. In a separate move, Lithuania also quit a multilateral forum led by China. The so-called 17 plus 1 group took shape in 2012 to deepen China's ties with Eastern Europe. But the program has fueled concerns in Western Europe. Many fear Beijing is seeking to divide the continent. Lithuania has asked other EU members to follow and step out of the pact as well. And the country has done more than that. It has also designated the Chinese regime's abuses against Uyghurs as genocide. Beijing dismisses the claims as outright lies. In regard to Hong Kong, Lithuania may offer more opportunities for people there thinking about leaving. That's as many Hong Kong residents face increasing political pressure due to Beijing's sweeping national security law. Hong Kong media Stand News reported that Lithuania is considering offering simplified immigration procedures for Hong Kong residents. It may happen in the near future. Beijing doesn't seem to be happy about Lithuania's recent moves. Chinese state-owned media Global Times is saying as such a small country, Lithuania is inviting big trouble. And coming up, new studies from the UK confirm children's risk of death or severe illness from the CCP virus is extremely low. One of the studies notes considerably more minors died from suicide in 2020 than of the virus. And Italian soccer fans are rejoicing after the Azzurri won the European Championship, defeating England. That and more here on NTD News. With Shepherd Lock, you can unlock your door by touching the deadbolt. 
Shepard also boosts your home's security by proactively freezing in place if anyone ever tries to tamper with your lock or break down your door. We also make it easy to manage keys without hiding them under the mat. Easily create temporary keys for house guests, neighbors, or anyone else. Installation takes less than five minutes. Visit shepherdlock.com to buy your Shepherd Lock today. And for a limited time, enjoy 10% off. Get ready, world, for a whole new way to invest. Introducing the Unicorn Hunters. We are talking about a cultural and economic shift. A savvy group of investors whose only job is to provide an unvarnished assessment of who they think can become the next unicorn. I am in and I'm going to invest. We all know why we're here. We're here to meet the next unicorn opportunity. This could be a game changer for a lot of families. Together with you, they're on the hunt for the next unicorn. As the debate continues over what virus precautions are necessary for children, new studies from the UK show that children's risk of death or severe illness is extremely low. One study also notes considerably more children died from suicide or trauma than of the virus. Here are the details. Children aged 18 and younger are at a very low risk of becoming severely ill or dying from the CCP virus. Three new studies from researchers at four UK universities confirmed these earlier findings. Researchers from one of the studies determined that out of the 61 minors who died with COVID between March 2020 and February 2021 in the UK, only 25 died as a direct result of the virus itself. The others, they found, died of an alternative cause, but coincidentally tested positive. In the UK, this equates to a mortality rate of about two in a million. Most of the 25 children had serious or multiple comorbidities. Only six appeared to not have underlying health conditions. The researchers noted that during the same time period studied, there were 124 deaths from suicide and 268 deaths from trauma, emphasizing COVID-19 is rarely fatal in children and teenagers. The study further noted the risk of removal of children and young persons from their normal activities across education and social events may prove a greater risk than that of the virus itself. Although the study didn't directly state a connection between lockdowns and death by suicide or trauma, correlations between spikes in youth suicide and lockdowns have been reported by mental health experts worldwide, including in the UK, Australia and the US. According to recent CDC data, suspected suicide attempts in adolescents rose 31 percent in the U.S. in 2020. Among adolescent girls, attempts increased by nearly 51 percent. The study's findings will be submitted to the U.K.'s Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization, which is considering whether to expand COVID-19 vaccination to children aged 12 to 17. Grace Coulter, NTD News. As England fans dream of what could have been, Italy is now celebrating as the Azzurri on Sunday brought home the biggest prize in European soccer. And today's Eddie Aitken brings us the story. Italians are set to celebrate victory against England in the Euro 2020 final for days to come. But on Monday morning, many people were just happy that there was something to celebrate. The Italian capital erupted overnight with people taking to the streets, waving flags and honking horns. As one of the European countries hardest hit by the pandemic, such scenes were a sight for sore eyes. We had a real need to meet each other again, to celebrate, to be happy, to have a shared moment. We really needed it. The players reached Rome shortly after dawn to find many fans still celebrating. Captain Giorgio Cialini, first off the bus, received a jubilant reception. The players, due to meet later with their Italian president and prime minister, the Italian manager thanked the Italian fans after the game. We are very happy for Italians. Italians living abroad, there were many at the stadium today. Italians over the world, and especially Italians across Italy. Because I think we really have given them a wonderful month of success and joy, and we are very happy about that. The news dominated the headlines with the morning edition of national newspapers hailing the victory. La Gazzetta dello Sport had two beautiful on its front page. 
the fan zone of the center of town dismantled in the morning. Working in the events business, we have been very inactive for over a year, so this has been a great moment of restart for the whole country, and to have ended with a final victory has given us that extra joy. Today we start to dismantle the fan zone with a smile. Forza Italia! Forza Italia. As champions of Europe, the Azzurri now have their sights on world domination with the World Cup in Qatar next year. Eddie Aiken, NTD News. Expectation, celebration and disappointment. The Eurofinals were a close call. After all the drama, there is a feeling of national pride for the three Lions despite England's defeat. NTD's Jane Worrell has this report. Football was almost home. Luke Shaw's goal in the first half felt like it was a long time ago by the time it came to penalties. There was elation, anticipation and disappointment. The opportunity for the trophy may be gone for now, but England fans felt proud of their team in the country's first major final in 55 years. I think when we had a, a, a moment to take the momentum, we missed it, personally. But look, you've got to give credit to the team and to Gareth Southgate and all the players. They've done a fantastic job for our country. I'm very proud of them. The boys done amazingly well. And it's sickening. Sickening. Congratulations to the Italians. They sort of deserved it, but we would have preferred it. Fans who watched in Trafalgar Square also felt the heartbreak. Before the match, we asked some fans if they felt like football was one of the few places where they could fly the England flag and be proud of their nation. In other situations, it comes across as nationalistic and things, but I feel like everybody's just so proud of how far we've come for once <laughs> that we have to just go full send. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's a good way of like supporting the nation, because usually we wouldn't have that, so we get to do it through the football, which is good. I would have said that national pride is probably at its highest now because of the football, but in spite of COVID. Because of all the restrictions, people have been kept apart, but now the football's brought everybody together. So I would say that's yeah. what's made national pride the highest that it is now. I know I am, I'm sure I am, I'm England till I die. England till I die. Kind of everyone gets brought up more with football. It seems to be more encouraged by from a younger age, so I think it's more, I think for, as a cultural aspect, football just seems to be ingrained in like almost everyone that you see. So um, even the ones that aren't really into it, when, it's, when England are on, like it, all of a sudden, people that aren't like, necessarily interested in the football become more interested because England are on. And yeah, obviously become more proud of their country, so as they should be. For a while, this country has been ashamed to be proud of itself. That's uh, not the why we voted over Brexit, because we wanted to go our own way. I, I think it's the opposite. Basically. I think historically we've we've done some bad things. Um, and Is it that's, about football though, rather than and that's made us, up the past? <laughs> and that's made us to be a bit of a shame of ourselves. But I think with the sports we've we've never done anything bad and it's something to be proud of. I was born in England, I'm, I'm Caribbean, but I'm born in England, so I'm gonna support England, you know what I mean? The games united people after a difficult 18 months of pandemic restrictions. The three Lions didn't triumph and the hurt continues, but the team has improved each time. Their fans will be supporting them the next time around. Jane Warrell, NTD News, London. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Evelyn Lee.
have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trusted